Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another Facebook Live. I'm Justin Canoe Haller, co-founder. We're going to have Senator Ramesh Akbari here with us today talking about mainly school vouchers, but we'll get into some other stuff too. TNHaller.com, at the TN Holler on Twitter and Facebook. These small dollar monthly donations that you guys contribute really go a long way. They help us get the message out. They help keep us going. Thank you to everybody who is doing that. Teachers, we've got parents, we've got business leaders. Pro public education folks up here on the hill today. It's not going to do anything good for our public school system that's already underfunded. They are not for vouchers. No one wants it. Why would you do it to another county? Bad for Nashville and Shelby County School. Ramesh. Hey there. I haven't really talked to you much, so it's really nice to get to know you in person a little bit. Likewise, I've been following you guys, so I feel like I know you too. And I've talked to your mom before, so. My mom? <laughs> yep, yep, yep. We had a lovely chat. <laughs> well, I didn't realize that. Well, my mom is actually here right now because we're expecting a baby any day now. Let's talk about the thing that we're here to talk about, starting with the moment where it passed the House. All those in favor of House Bill 939, vote aye. Those opposed will vote no. Go get Moon. The vote was tied, 49-49. Cassida held it open 35 minutes, pulled people out onto the balcony. Nobody knew what was going on. And then after 35 minutes... Ms. Clark, take the vote. Jason Zachary. Ah, it's 50, 48 days. I hereby declare passed. It's an improper vote, and that's an invalid passage of a bill. Changed the vote. What were you thinking when all that was going down, Senator? I was shocked. I mean, I was in the House for five years. That had not happened before. I couldn't believe it. I thought that it, it failed and then they just kept digging and trying to find additional votes. And uh, I was shocked. And then it moved into the, the Senate. How did you feel about its chances there? Typically, in the years that I was in the House, the legislation passed in the Senate. There were some factors that kind of came out around the actual cost of the legislation, some disputes about whether homeschoolers would be able to apply and also about undocumented students but at the end of the day they circled the wagons it was going to pass i have a little bit from the senate debate the tennessee education savings account pilot program not aimed at hurting schools but indeed at helping children pilot program the only thing that makes this a pilot project is that we've changed the name there's no sunset it doesn't go away i wouldn't myself describe this as a pilot program there is no hard trigger in this to terminate the program if the results are not as we hope they are if this is a pilot program it should look like a pilot program a sharp end date to it parameters that we're looking to achieve otherwise it's not a pilot program it's a predatory program why would we choose to do a pilot program in a district that is so different from every other district. It only affects Shelby County, Davidson County. Would you clarify that this does not include the LEAs in District 32? It's okay, Bill, as long as it doesn't apply to their county. A lot of folks don't have as much heartburn about this bill because their school district is not in it. I think that's a really important point that you made there. If this is such a good idea, why don't they want it in their district? Why were they all trying so hard to pull their district out of this school vouchers program. Right. I mean, if, if it's good for Memphis, if it's good for Shelby County and Davidson County, certainly it should be good for East Tennessee, especially when you have uh, several districts that really are on the cusp as far as achievement. So the very fact that Jason Zachary's justification for changing his vote was that Knox County would not be included lets you know that folks do not think that it's a good program. Do you have a sense of why Bill Lee made this his signature piece of legislation, why this was so important to him? I really don't. I mean, I think I'm just speculating, of course, but I think that he believes that it's just another option. I know he mentored a young man that he helped put into, I think, some charter schools. You're trying to target a demographic that cannot necessarily afford private school, so this should be a good thing for them. But unfortunately, it's one of those programs that sounds good on paper, but when you actually look at the details around it, it's not. One, because you have transportation barriers. Most schools that are private, tuition is much higher than what this voucher will cover. Two, they have admissions requirements. And so children that are not in a school that's performing well, more than likely won't be able to get in. And we don't have a definite list of schools that will even accept these educational vouchers. I think that when you look at other states like 
uh, Arizona, the D.C. area, and Florida, and Louisiana. There just has not been a record of success. I would rather, I said, hey, look, take the money and invest it in programs that you know work. I want to give our children opportunities. But I also don't want to experiment in the counties that need the help the most when we already have educational options and choice in our areas. We have optional schools, we have charter schools, we have the traditional public school. Private schools are already offering scholarships to folks. So I I just didn't think that it was the right step. We're already on the cusp of, you know, trying to move our achievement forward. This is the first year in like four years where our achievement test actually went off without a hitch. So kudos to Commissioner Swin and her team. Why try and shake the boat right now? If you have a ramp up period of two years, why are we trying to push it forward in additional year? They have this feeling that they want to help kids who feel like private school is out of reach, but this is a zero sum game. When you have a finite amount of dollars, if you want to steer some of those dollars to help a kid or a specific kid, somebody is losing out in that equation. If you really want to help these kids, maybe we should change the letter next to our school funding from an F to something other than an F. They never want to talk about adding dollars. They only want to talk about shuffling debt chairs on the Titanic. I actually talked to the one Democrat who voted for the vouchers, D. Barry. There were some things that he seemed amenable to that I think might be better solutions here. For instance, districting. The more we segregate schools, whether it be through vouchers or through charters or through districting, the more the bottom drops out. But do you think maybe that there is something to be looked at as far as districting to include some of the neighborhoods that have more resources with the the neighborhoods that don't? And that might be another way to deal with this rather than sending dollars from one place to another. I know that Clarksville is one of the top five biggest cities in Tennessee, and it has no failing schools, quote unquote, failing schools, partly because their districting is blind to neighborhoods. I know Memphis is not. Right. Memphis is not. Even further, when we created, or should I say, when the municipal areas created their own school districts, it further kind of segregated folks along socioeconomic and race lines. Um, So I definitely think that that would help. I mean, because you're taking resources and you're giving it a better opportunity to kind of be shared. That would be better. I mean, you see it's working in Clarksville. Why aren't we doing something that's working? Or you look at a model like the ISO. It's working really well in Shelby County. Why not expand that? There are just so many choices besides this complete alteration of of how children go to school through the voucher program. If we're here and it's not going to be repealed, at least don't rush it so that you have a program that does more harm than good. Your press release, which you put out, my understanding is there were budget hearings. And in those budget hearings, what we learned was voucher money would be treated as taxable income for the families that use it. Can you tell us what that means and why you see that as a problem? I've gotten a little bit more information. So we currently have a voucher program that's been implemented for children with special needs. The parents that receive those vouchers receive a 1099, kind of between them and their tax professional, how things are counted. But the bottom line is anything that's spent beyond tuition is eligible to be taxed. So say you have a parent that has three children that are eligible for the voucher, And they spend, you know, $2,500 on tuition, and then they buy uniforms, they buy a computer, they buy some other electronic devices, then that income is taxed. That will be considered taxable income. The repercussions are if you are on the cusp of moving to another tax bracket, or if you're near the cliff for entitlement programs, that can be pretty dangerous for you because you won't necessarily qualify for certain programming. That is information that really was not well known when we moved forward or when some of my colleagues voted for this legislation. Press pause and go back to the drawing board. What do you think needs to happen now? I I think it might be a bit much to ask them to go back to the drawing board, even though ideally I think that would be great. At least they need to make sure that whatever system is in place to engage parents is very clear because there seems to be some dispute on whether or not the income is taxable or not. If you're going to have this program, people need to know what the consequences are of accepting this voucher, what it's actually going to look like in practice, and they need to have a good counseling system set up so that parents know and families can make educated decisions. Until there are assurances that that's going to happen, 
there's no reason to speed walk this implementation. I would love to see it revisited entirely, but I don't know that that is going to happen. There's no reason to rush. There will be real consequences for families if they do not have all the information they need. And I just think that this is a big program to set up. We need to take our time. Well, it is obviously a big program, a lot of money being spent. Already we've seen Governor Lee or the administration has issued a $2.5 million contract to a Florida company named Class Wallet to manage the voucher payments. Do you know about this? And is there no company in Tennessee that can handle this? Yeah, I saw that. Obviously, we want Tennessee first. At the same time, I know that Florida's been dealing with vouchers for quite some time. So maybe they have more expertise. I guess General Services, the Department of Education deals with contracts. They put out an RFP. They select the one that makes the most sense. But ideally, of course, we want those dollars to stay in Tennessee. We have jobs that need to be created. We have economies that need to be stimulated. Unfortunately, education is a very expensive endeavor. Testing, you look at the fact that most school systems, like our school system budget in Shelby County, exceeds the cost of our Memphis City budget. It's expensive. Um And we'll just see how far this is going to go because the last day, the last hour when we were trying to vote for or against vouchers in the Senate, there was a big concern this would actually end up costing double what the projections were. That expensiveness that you're talking about, in my mind, is why this has become a priority. So now I'm going to put on my tinfoil hat a little bit here. I just want to show you something just in case you haven't seen it. Betsy DeVos was a big part of this process. She came here to help him sell it. Mm -hmm. She's been pushing this at the federal level. This is Betsy DeVos talking about her agenda at the federal Mm -hmm. level with education. Our desire is to be in that Shafela to um, confront the culture in which we all live today in ways which will continue to help Um, advance God's kingdom. Why waste your dollars on non-Christian things? Well, I think it goes back to what I just mentioned, the concept of really being active in the shefala of our culture, to impact our culture in ways that are not the traditional funding the Christian organization route, but that really may have greater kingdom gain in the long run by changing the way we approach things, in this case, um, the system of education in the country. That's Betsy DeVos saying that her agenda is to steer dollars to private Christian schools. Now, this is a faithful country, a faithful state. I don't fault anybody, their faith. But I do have a bit of a problem when we start to see public education dollars steered towards, as she called, the advancement of God's kingdom. I know plenty of Christians that would have a problem with that. Does that concern you at all when you hear that talk? It does seem to be at the core of a lot of what Billy does. Well, certainly. I mean, I'm a Christian too, and I wholeheartedly believe in the separation of church and state. And I think that those that want to push a specific religion, they just have to be prepared and be okay when other religious schools also Uh, want to accept vouchers. And what I've seen, there has not been a real tolerance for that. Based on the way the legislation is written, any religion would be eligible. But I prefer a firm separation of church and state. Everyone has the right to believe as they believe and the freedom to worship as they worship. And I don't think that that's something that should be pushed uh, through our public dollars, period. Anything else that we should know about vouchers? Vouchers have been a very a controversial issue. It took 12 years for this legislation to pass. The community really got involved and engaged, and I think that that's why the vote was so close. So certainly folks don't get discouraged just because it didn't turn out the way you wanted. Um, it's definitely not a time to be quiet. This is the time where we have to continue to raise our voices and fight against policies that we believe will be detrimental. These TANF funds, there's a block grant that comes to the state, supposed to go towards programs that help poor people in Tennessee, programs like daycare, programs like job training, programs like SNAP. And we just discovered, actually thanks to the Beacon Center, which is a conservative think tank, that $730 million have been sitting in an account not being spent. I told a friend of mine who's a social worker about that in schools here, and she says she thinks she's going to be sick. She says she knows of families that she has worked with specifically who have applied for those daycare funds, been denied, Mm -hmm. and lost their children. Mm -hmm. And so as Governor Lee calls for days of prayer and expresses these feelings of regret for some of the ways that the poor are treated in Tennessee as we see that we are 
number one in medical bankruptcies and rural hospital closures per capita at the bottom in poverty and infant mortality and maternal mortality. The list goes on. I, I say this list every single day on Twitter around that. So I know it pretty well. Uh, how do you feel when you find out that this state is sitting on close to a billion dollars in aid for our poorest citizens? Poverty in Tennessee is a statewide problem. East Tennessee, Middle Tennessee, West Tennessee, rural and urban. So many families that live in deep poverty. From my understanding, Tennessee has put a limit below whatever the federal limit is on TANF eligibility as far as within your lifetime. So you have a certain time period and then you'll run out. I know that there are opportunities to provide wraparound services at schools, to help people in situations where they don't have child care. There's so much the Department of Human Services can do. Now, I will say it did not take a year. It did not take two years for this surplus to build up. So I'm happy that there's a move forward to try and spin this down. But, you know, faith without works is dead, okay? We can pray for folks all we want to, and that's powerful. But when we're in positions to actually provide financial support wraparound services that are so desperately needed and we turn the other cheek or we let money sit in an account while for some families it's literally is a matter of life and death is unacceptable. So I'm happy that we're moving forward with spending. I'm very interested in this work group that I've been appointed to. Our first meeting is actually in an hour. Uh, so we'll see kind of what the legislature's role is. But this is more of an executive branch function. So I'm happy that there was a plan that was released yesterday. We'll see. The decision to only maintain a three-year reserve is a lot better than what we've been doing. Uh, but we'll see. Honestly, and I know the legislature sees this almost a billion dollars, and then they want to have their hands in it, too. So I wonder if it's going to, you know, break down into a fight between the executive and the legislative branch. At the end of the day, the truth is, it's actually a lot more than a billion dollars. It's close to $8 billion when you include the Medicaid expansion funds that we've been rejecting for, for multiple, multiple years. I'm going to play you one last video before I let you go, because I want you to see this. This is yesterday. This is Rep. William Lambert at the 10 Care hearing. He was lamenting that couples are potentially getting divorced so that they could keep their health care because together couples had an income that was too high to keep their health care. He seemed to say this with no sense of irony that his party is the one that isn't expanding Medicaid and causing this to happen. It calls a lot of times for married couples that do not hit the financial eligibility because of the fact that they are married. Thus, it increases their household income. And the most heartbreaking thing that I can get from a constituent is a call from usually a husband that says, Mr. Lamberth, I've talked to a lawyer, and this is usually somebody I've tried for weeks to help, and that lawyer has told me that if I'll divorce my wife and leave my kids, that they're eligible for 10 care. And you know what? They're right. Many times they're absolutely right that it will put them within the eligibility. For God's sakes, that's, that's just wrong. There should be a way that we can fix that, but we should never have any type of a disincentive to marriage out there, especially in the world that we live in this day and age. It's a distinct failure in the program where I think we can do better. This is not a new problem, first of all. This isn't unique to Tennessee, but it demonstrates not only that if we expand Medicaid, this will happen less, but it also shows why we need to get everybody in this country covered. How, how do you feel when you watch that? Representative Lamberth and I have worked together on some really good criminal justice reform, so I respect him a great deal. I don't know if it was intentional with his comment, but I'm hoping this begins a different conversation because, quite frankly, I we've been talking about expanding Medicaid since I got to the legislature, and I do not know how we as a state and as fiduciary leaders of our state can turn down funds that we are entitled to. When our hospital association has agreed to fill in whatever gap that federal funding does not um, actually provide, this is ridiculous. I told my colleagues, look, my urban hospitals are not going to close. They might not get the upgrades they need, but they're not closing. People who live in rural communities have to drive 45 minutes to get to an emergency room. And this is supposed to be the United States of America. I want us to put politics aside and focus on the policy that is going to help the most people. President Obama has been out of office for three years now. Stop tying the Affordable Care Act to Obamacare. Do what's right for your constituents. Do what's right for this state. I know people have nightmares about Governor Bredesen having to kick people off of ten care. Well, I have nightmares about those who are dying because they don't have coverage. I look at a state like Louisiana, where within the first several months of them implementing the expansion of Medicaid, they were able to detect women through preventative care who had breast cancer, 
who would not have otherwise gotten those services. So this is ridiculous. I hope my colleagues will finally start to see the light. I am on a modernization of healthcare task force that will meet in December. And I really hope that this is a part of that conversation. Is there any hope? You know, when it failed the last go around, we had a different person in leadership. I think in the Senate, there's always a fiscal concern that's been expressed. So I think if we can make the numbers make sense, which I think they do, it might have some legs. And also when it failed in the Senate, that was a unique configuration of that committee. We'll see. A lot has changed. A lot more hospitals have closed. It's become more of a bipartisan issue, I believe, from constituents. Healthcare is a big deal. And if you look at a state like Kentucky, it's a red state and they've expanded Medicaid. And I think that was a pivotal reason why the last governor was so unpopular. One, his attacks on teachers, but also his attack on healthcare. Well, that's good. Yeah. I'm going to feed off of your optimism. Kentucky and Louisiana both talk about Medicaid expansion as a main mm-hmm. reason for why the results were the way they were. As you mentioned, it would be free for us. It was a Republican governor's plan that they rejected. $3 million a day is what we're losing. They claim that it's because they don't want to take federal help. Meanwhile, we get 37% of our budget from the federal government already. So mm-hmm. there is no principled stance being taken here. We are one of the most dependent states And something needs to change. I I like that you brought up that Obama's been out of office for three years because there's simply no question that it's their bias against him that's keeping them from doing the right thing here. And they're putting Mm -hmm. politics over people. And it's frankly policy murder. We know that mothers are dying and that there are very real people behind these numbers. Senator, thank you for joining us here. I really appreciate it. I know you have a meeting to get to. Please keep doing the good work you're doing. No, thank you. And please keep doing the good work that you're doing. The spotlight that you all are shining on Tennessee is so important. So thank you. Fowler the holler. (laughs) Perfect. Tennessee. Tennessee. Tennessee.